In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Jeremiah writes these laments over the fall of Jerusalem, over the captivity of Judah. Babylon strips the land bare, takes away the people from the land and the hope from the people. And yet the prophet, even in his laments, even in his crying out, knows that the Lord is with Israel. He's with Jeremiah. And yes, he's with you and me. He talks about how the mercies never come to an end. Sometimes it seems like God turns off the tap. Sometimes it seems like what he's giving us is slowed down to a trickle, like hot, dry times in a Midwestern summer. But we know where to look and we know what we get from him. And we know we get what we need most when we need it most. My soul, the prophet says, and we can say this with him, this is what my soul says, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my main course, my big helping. The Lord is what I can sink my teeth into. He is the one from whom I can gain physical and emotional and most of all spiritual sustenance. Therefore, I will hope in him. And of course, we know that literally in the supper that our Savior gave us, we do sink our teeth into the Lord. We do take him into ourselves, but we take him in through our ears, through our eyes. God gives us our senses so that we not only can navigate this world, but most of all, so that we can receive the gifts from him. Whether we're living in our now fallen world, whether we've been with Adam and Eve before the fall or in all of eternity, we are physical beings and our physical senses are part of the way we interact with God, part of the way that he blesses us. And the Lord is good for those who wait. Today's gospel talks about a woman who has been waiting, going from doctor to doctor to doctor for 12 years. And I dare say that there's people listening to this today who have been going from doctor to doctor to doctor. Some maybe more than 12 years. Some for a short time, but it seems like forever because it's a worrisome cause, whether it's for you or for somebody you love. And there is no help, but in the Lord, we always find the help that we truly need. He's good to those who wait. He's good for the soul who seek him. And we know where he's going to be found. He's going to be found in his word, in his supper, in the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing us to faith and keeping us in faith, admonishing us, correcting us, and then forgiving us in Christ for every sin that we commit. And so it's good that we wait quietly. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't complain, but we don't make a scene out of it. God knows that we not only do complain, but he invites our complaints when they're made to him or with the woman bringing them to the doctors. But even if humans can't or won't answer our complaints or don't give us the answer we want, that doesn't mean that we don't ask God. But we ask knowing that whatever answer we get will be the right answer at the right time for the right reason. And it's not always going to be the answer that we want. But it's going to be the answer that best fits us. Not just for however many years we live on this earth, but for eternity. Because God, most of all, wants to give us the answers to the things that we really need. How do I have God in my life? How do I have eternal life? And that only comes from our relationship with him from knowing him, from listening to him, to following where he leads, to trusting in his promises, to listening when he corrects us, and trying not to do that same dumb thing over and over again. And there is a lot of waiting involved. Waiting quietly for the salvation of the Lord is hard. It's hard to wait for anything from the Lord, really, but for something that's really important, for something that's really pressing, the wait gets more difficult. And then it goes on, it's good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Well, I guess it's good practice. 
If everything comes too easily for too long and then trouble hits us in later life and we're not ready for it, we don't have the practice of being hurt and finding out that we can continue on, of losing and finding out that we still have something, have the things that are truly important, of seeing things disappear only to have better things appear. If calamity hits us at the end of our days or near the end without any warning, without any preparation, And so God schools us in our everyday lives in part so that we can take more on ourselves later on, but not only for ourselves, so that we can give comfort and counsel and aid to those who disaster also hits. When we go through the troubles of life, we can help others also come through those troubles with our words, with our example, and merely with our presence. When you have seen this pass, then you can say to somebody else, this too shall pass. But yet we're eager all the time to give God a little bit of help, a little bit of a push to get it going a little bit faster, to tug on his robes and say, hey, hey. Of course, sometimes when we reach out to tug on God's robes, we find an answer like the woman did. But she wasn't reaching out randomly for help. If you love me, if you see me, if you think you can help me, she has faith that if she reaches out and grabs the hem of Jesus' robes, she will receive what she needs. Healing. And she gets more than that even. She gets an affirmation of her faith from the one in whom she has faith. But... For most of us, we bear, we wait, and finally we see what God has in store for us. But we don't wait alone, do we? It's not only that we're waiting with one another, but we have a Savior who goes through all of these or has gone through all of these things. We think about this for ourselves, but this applies even more to the one who came to rescue us. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him, like Jesus not answering those who torment him, the ones who accuse him unjustly, who put him on trial, who beat him, who crown him with thorns, and who lead him off to be crucified. As Isaiah talks about how he is the sheep silently before the shear, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he says not a thing. So Jeremiah also reminds us of this, and we can apply this also then to Jesus. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. We don't know how far Jesus bowed down in prayer at times, but I imagine, if not physically, certainly in every other aspect, he was as low as he could be when he was pleading with his father in the garden. And when he fell with the cross, his face down in the road with that load on top of himself. He knows what it's like to be face down in the dust. Not only symbolically, not only metaphorically, but literally. With the weight of every sin crushing down on him even heavier than that piece of wood that he's dragging out with him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Sometimes the prophets undersell God's promises. They toss out a crumb knowing that there's a full banquet coming behind it, but they don't reveal it all yet, do they? There may be hope. There is hope. We know this. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes. Let him be filled with insults. When we suffer for the sake of the gospel, obviously, we are suffering with Jesus who suffered for us. But even in other things, when we bear the assaults of Satan, when we bear the physical afflictions of this world, when we bear the discomforts, the trials, the separations, the death of family and friends, the desertion of those we thought we could trust, whatever else, we still are not alone because we have one who went through all of that before us so that he could be there with us as we go through it. He gave his cheek. He didn't lash out. He didn't call down lightning from heaven. He didn't say, hey, angel army, get me out of here. Slaughter these unbelievers. Scatter them to the four winds. Drive them off. No. 
he went into a captivity that led him to death. Because the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he caused grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of a steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. When God gives you something, it is not because he wants to have fun watching you suffer. He wants you to learn from that suffering, to grow in that suffering. And most of all, he wants to see when it comes as a correction or as a reproof to not do that, to turn away from the sin and turn to the one who forgives sin, to receive his blessings with joy and with thanksgiving. The Lord sent his son for you so that he would not send you off forever. He doesn't cast you off forever. Sometimes it seems like you're at arm's length with God. But all of a sudden you realize that that arm is wrapped around you and drawing you oh so closely. He doesn't crush underfoot all of the prisoners of the earth or deny justice or to subvert someone in a lawsuit as the Lord criticizes others for doing just after this section. No, the Lord represents justice because the Lord is just. He looks at the sins of man and he blames, he accuses, and he punishes his sinless son. He doesn't cast us off forever because he sent his son Jesus off from the glory of heaven. He doesn't condemn us to the pits of hell, to everlasting torment, everlasting loss, everlasting shame and pain. But he sent his son for a time of suffering and shame and pain that it might be taken away from us. The Lord doesn't cast off forever. The Lord ultimately embraces forever. He calls forever and he keeps forever. Every one of us who trusts in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, every one of us who realizes that that son came down from heaven so that we could be brought up into God's presence and live in the new kingdom, in the everlasting kingdom, and the new heavens and the new earth without pain, without sorrow, and without suffering forever and ever. And so we sit, we wait. We do complain from time to time, and God listens to our complaints, even if the people around us don't seem to. But God also then gives us who have been comforted and aided and blessed by him, the opportunity to be then the comfort and the blessing and the aid to others. Whether it's a quiet ministry or a presence or an active ministry of doing for others, he puts all sorts of opportunities into our lives to show the love that he has for us and our love for others. He doesn't call us to ignore the complaints of others because he doesn't ignore the complaints of his children but he calls us to be as compassionate as he is, as kind and caring and giving as he is. And though we always fail at this, we never stop trying. Because just as Christ participated in our suffering, so we now participate as the body of Christ in his mission to live, to love, to be part of his kingdom here in anticipation of being part of the eternal kingdom. And of whatever we do to expand the kingdom, to consolidate the kingdom, and to bring blessings into the kingdom by everything we say, think, and do. It's good to wait quietly. And it's good to sing loud praises. It's good to bear the yoke. And it's wonderful to have the yoke removed. Or to realize that we have that new yoke that Christ gives us. My yoke is easy and my burden light. Not a crushing yoke of oppression, but rather the yoke of love, the yoke that he hitches us onto so that we can step forward in harmony with one another. All going in the same direction for the same purpose under the guidance of the same Savior. We may end up with our mouths in the dust. And finally, unless the Lord comes again, we will end up with our entire bodies in the dust and returning to the dust. But we know that out of that dust, we will be raised up. And from that dust, we will be called to live forever. So if we're filled with insults, if we're scorned, laughed at, abandoned, mistreated, if disease takes over our bodies, 
if crippling ailments bother us, if we end up losing our loved ones and finally even losing our own lives, we yet lose nothing that truly matters because the Son lost everything that we might have it all in the resurrection. Though we cause grief, he will have compassion. He does have compassion, and he will always have compassion. True compassion, a suffering with, a feeling, and a participating in our emotions, our aches and our pains, our highs and our lows, our laughs and our cries. The Lord in our flesh felt these things, did these things, knew these things, and in our flesh, he still knows these things. According to the scriptures, he still bears the wounds, the scars that he presents as his trophies of a victory won. Testimony of his love for us. Because whatever we go through, because we are sinners, finally we are forced to say, we deserve it. But Jesus didn't. And Jesus got worse than we did so that we don't get what we deserve, but rather what he earned for us. God grant that we hope for the Lord, wait for the Lord, trust in the Lord, knowing that whether or not we receive health and healing and restoration, now we will receive health and healing and restoration in eternity. And even if we're slowed down, even if we're hurting, even if we're dragging one leg behind the other, unable to drag either one of our legs, our Lord is right there with us, taking us along the road, leading us through this life to the life yet to come. God grant you peace and joy and hope. The faith of the woman who is suffering all of those years to reach out and touch Jesus. The faith of Jairus to say, Lord, please help me. And even when all the friends say, she's dead, to rather listen to Jesus, the author of life. Because in Jesus, we are not truly and forever dead. We have died in our baptisms, his death. And now in our baptisms, we live his life. And that life will not end. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.